Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Tate Podcast. My name is Evan Forrester, and I am here with Russell Watson. He is the Solutions Marketing Manager for Public Safety here at Tate. So, uh, Russell, today we're going to be talking about P25 and open standards and, and how that works. Uh, so just to start us off, I was wondering if you could explain to us, what is P25? Okay, Evan, um, P25 is a digital land mobile radio standard. Um, and that standard uh, was basically developed by public safety users for public safety. So it describes um, how functionally um, the P25 or the radio works um, and defines that so a number of manufacturers can design radios to that standard and so public safety users get the benefits out of the radio system that they, they want. So it's interesting that the users helped develop it. And I guess my question would be, why did P25 come about? What was the process in that? Yeah, so uh, P25 actually uh, was the second version of a standard designed by public safety for public safety. Uh, originally there was a, a project or a, a standard called Project 16, which described how functionally radios worked for public safety. So that was trying to solve the problem where different manufacturers developed radios that had different user interfaces. However, that didn't solve all the problems because you had radios that then couldn't talk to each other because they didn't transmit the signals in the same way and they didn't have the same functionality. So Project 25 was looking to take it that next step. It was looking to take it to a step where different vendors could develop radios that not only had the same, had a user interface that was uh, common or were functionally common, but also could communicate with each other to allow different public safety agencies to communicate. All through the 90s, P25 was being developed and, and identified. When 9-11 happened, uh, the demand for interoperable radio equipment seemed to really increase a lot. Could you talk about that a little more? Well, what happened there was you had multiple agencies, um, fire, police, um, all using land mobile radios, um, and they couldn't talk to each other. Um, they don't need to talk to each other, firemen to policemen, but they do need to be able to talk back to their command, into their command structure. And right. for uh, the commanders, the incident commanders on the scene to be able to direct their, their, their teams, um, and that, that was shown to fall to bits um, during 9-11. Mm. And that really pushed, because of the ma- number of lives that were lost uh, of public safety professionals, that really drove um, this whole standard and... Uh, the US government in particular put a lot of money into seeing standards-based systems put in place for public safety agencies. Yeah, okay. So it's been over 10 years now, 10 and a few. Um, How successful would you say Project 25 has been? I would say it's had mixed success. Uh, I would say, because if you look at just the the sheer numbers, um, if you look, well, let's just look at the US market as a start. Uh, The US market, probably somewhere between... A quarter and a third of agencies have gone to Project 25 based communications in some way, uh, whether that is a conventional system or a trunk system. Um, so we haven't seen you know, 100% uptake of it. Um, and it still doesn't allow complete interoperability, and it still isn't delivering all the benefits that public safety uh, wanted from the system when it was uh, put into place. It's certainly not as ubiquitous as, say, IP in the um, networking or the internet type industry. It's not as ubiquitous as that. Um, So, you know, you'll still see systems, and it's quite commonplace to see systems where uh, you have your Project 25 trunk system in place and you put a conventional analog overlay, sorry, a conventional simulcast overlay over the top to uh, still enable some interoperability or mutual aid um, because even though you've got a standards-based system as your comm system, doesn't mean the people next door to you have that. And so analog still is used as glue, in, particularly in the US. Uh, around the world, it's had uptake. Um, so it is a global standard, which is one of the original goals for the standard. And that standard uh, is seen in countries like Australia, New Zealand, in the Middle East, in Russia and places like that. It tends to be used um, where you have large geographic areas that are less densely populated. Because it's actually one of the other things it was designed for was to actually be a replacement for analog. Mm. Okay, so it's got the same sort of coverage footprint. So some people can't 
interoperate with others? Is that because they're on P25 and the other people are on analog? So it's a mix of reasons. Okay. You know, so interoperability, um, if you look at it as a, as a multi, there's a multitude of reasons why people can't uh, interoperate. And technically, te the technical layer is just one of them. Okay. okay. Um, you've got your political and you've got your operational and you've got sure. a whole lot of other layers on top of that. You can solve the technical one to a degree. Okay, so you can um, either using P25 and getting neighbours on the same uh, standard um, allow a degree of interoperability, but then it still requires the radios to be on the same frequency, those sorts right. of things. And this is why you start to see multiband radios and all these sorts of other issues start to appear. Then what you find is that uh, depending on the feature set that the uh, agency or the, the manufacturers or vendors put in, they, they, the system may not be completely um, standards based. There could be some mm. proprietary elements to it, uh, which means certain features don't work or certain capabilities um, don't work. The other thing to remember actually is that um, a standard is a bit like the law. It's not, yeah. it's not, the law is not even black and white and neither are standards. So people interpret the standard in a certain way, they implement uh, the standard in a way that they believe was, it was intended um, and whether two devices that have been developed to the standard work together um, is still something that needs to be tested. Mm -hmm. And that is tested um, via a process called CAP testing. So standards aren't the complete answer, and then you know you do need this interoperability testing, and you do see the same thing in the IP industry where you see plug fests, where different vendors come together, plug their equipment together to make sure it does work, even though they have standards right. in that industry as well. Okay, so you mentioned some of these can have proprietary features. Is there an example you could give of that? Um, a common one that comes up is encryption. So yep. some vendors will give away uh, encryption. Uh, uh, which is you know quite a, quite a key feature for public safety um, because many vendors charge for that um, because right. it's a value add feature. Um, some give it uh, uh, give it away uh, that then effectively locks out other vendors. Right. And one of the key drivers for public uh, for P twenty five um, that was put in this that was desired by the users when they put the standard together was to allow multi vendor sourcing and to allow a competitive right. environment to exist. We haven't got to the point where that competitive environment really, really exists the same way it does in the IP mm -hmm. world. So the idea would be that one agency, a uh, public safety agency, could have radios from three or four different vendors and they could all work together. Yep. They could have radios from three, however many vendors sure. they, they needed and they could choose uh, radios from vendor A for, say, their dog squad and they could use radios from radio vendor B for their parking meter wardens and right. that sort of thing depending on the functionality and the capabilities of the radio but they could all still talk back to, to right. the comm centre. Yeah. Okay. And that has not really been achieved yet. So Not to its full potential. So there yeah. is systems around the world, for example. Um, we have systems running on other vendors' mm. infrastructure, as do okay. our competitors have yep. um, our radios running on their infrastructure. So it has, been to achieve, it has been achieved to a point, but not to the level, I think, that um, you know, the Department of Homeland Security in the U.S. would have wanted, and not right. to the degree where the original people that put started the standard, that started right. the standard would have wanted it to be achieved. So there's obvious advantages for a public safety agency to have this open environment where they can have their network infrastructure with a certain vendor and then a few years later when their portables need upgrading they can go to a different vendor who might have a better product mm. at the time. What can public agencies do today to ensure that they're building an open environment? So what they can do is actually a number of things. One of them is to ensure that when they specify their system, they only specify items that are known to be standardised. So they restrict the amount of proprietary capability um, that's in the system. They have to, it's a trade-off. You have to ask yourself, is the benefit you get from the feature worth more than the benefit you would get from having a multi-vendor system? And you have to make that trade-off. Right. Okay, so you have to uh, really re restrict the amount of non-standard stuff, okay? So that's the, that's the key uh, thing you need to do. And then you need to have the willingness, I suppose, 
to actually bring in other vendors, mm. uh, systems or radios into your network um, to ha- have the willingness to trial them, to test them and make sure they do actually provide that, right. that functionality that you would expect. Mm. Yep. So you have to, it's a commitment on your part, but there is a financial benefit that you would get from it. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, and even I think a time benefit, whereas you know, a particular vendor five years from now may not be the best option. But if you're forced to continue using that vendor, you're not you, you aren't future proofed. Well, if you yeah, I mean that's the beauty of the, actually the standards based systems is mm. that standards evolve over time, um, and if multiple vendors are uh, designing to that standard, you can jump horses right. down 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 the track to yeah. to pick up the capabilities or the the other benefits that other vendors are providing. Mm. You mentioned cap testing. Uh, earlier, just in case people don't know, could you explain what that is? So cap testing, as I said, is a bit like um, the plug fest or the, uh, the, the, the the testing they do in the IP world uh, or the internet industry, and that's where different vendors, um, different manufacturers of uh, radio equipment, they come together and they go through a common series of tests, a predefined series of tests um, that are test cases re- centered around the standard to make sure those radios work together. And that information uh, is then put on the DHS SafeCom website. So you can see, for example, that the Tate TP9400 portable has been tested to meet the P25 standard um, under the CAT testing program, and it's been tested against the whatever other vendors it's been tested against. And you can see where there has been, let's just say failures, where the interpretation of the standard has been different. Mm. Okay, well the implementation of the standard has been different. So you can see where that is. And then the vendors get the, or the manufacturers get the chance to go back, correct those differences, and right. make sure that's, that you do get the, the coming together of the, of the two radios. Okay. So if uh, someone was about to buy or uh, bring in a new P25 system, would there be any warnings you would give them? Uh, I think mean, there's, there's many warnings. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's a big undertaking. It's, it's something that people uh, tend to only do, you know, if, you're a, if you manage a radio system, you tend to only do it, you know, once in your life, maybe twice if you're, if you're lucky. Um, right. So it's not something you do regularly. Um, so key thing is get good advice from people that do it day to day. Um, mm. We do it day to day. There's consultants out there that do it day to day. There's people that um, do this thing as part of their day job and so um, get good advice from them and get good advice from a, a multitude of people. Then I would say look for standards um, because uh, standards are the thing, as you said, that will future-proof you um, and that will give you options in terms of things like interoperability, multi-vendor, um, sys- multi-vendor, uh, com- multi-vendor competitive environment uh, and all the benefits that P25 is going to, going to give mm-hmm. you. Then um, really ask yourself uh, when you start getting offered add-ons, so proprietary features, does the benefit you're going to get from those right. outweigh the benefit you will get from creating a competitive environment and also having a choice of vendor? Because as right. you said before, um, even different vendors are going to implement uh, future things in, a, in different ways and the v- best vendor today may not be the best vendor or manufacturer tomorrow. I mean we're in a, a point of inflection in the market actually where um, LMR is evolving and we've got uh, broadband and LTE and mission critical LTE on the horizon and what you also need to be looking for is a company that can can help you manage that transition and take you through that transition. Again, um, LTE is a, is a, is a standards-based system, and, and how can somebody mesh, what's the vendor that can best right. mesh, or manufacturing the best mesh, your P25 mission critical system with your LTE mission critical system, and manage that change and manage that transition. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, as we move forward and new, newer and more communication technologies come about, these open standards will be even more important. Even more important. Yeah. yeah. And you know, to, be, to be honest, I think some of these other, public safety is starting to look at some of these other standards because, you know, back to your first question earlier on, has P25 lived up to its, its promise or the, the, right. the, the promise or the intent that the people uh, originally uh, had for it? And some would say no, and some are seeing these more of these IT or IP-based mm. uh, standards, albeit developed to a mission-critical um, 
uh, capability as being the answer to really get that competitive environment going um, and to uh, really deliver the benefits that P25 mm-hmm. was intended to deliver plus more. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay, well, uh, thank you, Russell. Um, do you have anything else to add on P25? No, it's, I mean it is an it is evolving standard. Um, yep. we, you know, we, it's, it's been in the it's been in the uh, in the making for for twenty years. It's pretty mature, um, right. as I said, um, but that doesn't mean to say that oh everything that's in the standard has been implemented. So right. it's still evolving. We're seeing phase two. We're seeing ISSI. We're seeing SATA, that some of that stuff starting to to flow flow through. Mm. So you know, it was intended to be an evolving standard, and it has involved evolved. Yeah. Um, it's going to be interesting to see, as I said, what happens in the next five to ten mm-hmm. years as we see the evolution to other mission critical yeah. standards. And it does sound like, I mean, even though it's maybe not perfectly successful, that if agencies are smart and ask the right questions and do the right research, they can have an open standards system and, and, and really have a, a good choice in the future. Oh, and they can get, I mean, even more, even they can get the benefits from yeah. having. Uh, an open standards based system. So for example, we do know that some of our largest customers who we um, supply equipment to, who have gone for this multi-vendor um, sure. environment, have saved themselves a third of the budget. Wow. And um, their, their systems are so large, we are talking um, somewhere in the order of a billion dollars. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So you, this is a very large system, but you could imagine if you can save a third on the cost of your system by going to a multi-vendor standards-based system, right. um, you have to ask yourself, is the benefit of some proprietary features really worth it? Yeah. Because um, that's a lot of money. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, there you go. So that's quite promising, and I think it's definitely worth investigating more. If you guys would like to learn more about ensuring you have P25 open standards, I recommend you check out p25bestpractice.com. There is a specifying your P25 system guide there, uh, which can be really helpful. And as Russell said earlier, talk to people who've been there before. And the guide was made with uh, advice from different consultants and people who've actually gone through the process themselves. So some really helpful information there. Uh, Thanks once again for listening to the Tape Podcast. We hope it was helpful. And Russell, thank you for joining us. Thanks, Evan.